and we're back. So we were talking a little bit about kind of the nature of research and how, how it evolves and how our teaching evolves. And it just made me think about how, with the studies that I'm sharing today, is one thing is just kind of led into another, you know, and something, a question came up based on my teaching, based on my research, based on my own life experiences, um, or I saw something online and said, I want to know more about this. And so these first couple of studies I shared, looking at like, the digital poetry that emerged from my work as a teacher, or looking at the, the remix poetry that um, kind of emerged something that I was seeing in the classroom, it's not dissimilar to what I'll talk about next, which is um, Insta poetry. Um, I feel like with social media, I'm always like a little bit like late to the game with some things, and so I'm still not on Snapchat. Although I've been joking with my son, I'll, I'll download Snapchat just to like, tell him to, you know, clean his room or something. But um, Instagram, I didn't get on at first, but then my students really persuaded me to. Said, "Oh, look, it's a really great way to share photos, and you travel a lot, you know." So I do have, you know, my, my Instagram for um, for photos, especially for travel. But then in recent years, I started seeing people using Instagram in different ways. And something that's really interesting with technology is that end users of technology do not always uh, employ it the way that we think they're going to. And so um, if you've ever tried to design something for people to use with technology, you'll know that sometimes they take it up in very different ways, or they don't appreciate the features that you put in, or they didn't um, you use it in the way that you anticipated it. Um, some of my other projects, we had some funding from the Australian government, the Office of Learning and Teaching. We actually developed this um, online professional development tool for um, teachers within higher education to reflect on their um, evaluations and develop their assessments. And in working as a developer on that, you realize that people don't always take up things the way you think they're going to. And with Instagram, this is actually what we've seen happen with poetry. So Instagram was made for images, you know, and what people started doing though is using it to share their words as well or their words and combined with different images and so instagram is being used to share poems which incorporate these multimodal elements that include text and images um, and these include comments and hashtags to share in categories or poems so this current article is actually in press for the university or sorry for the united kingdom literacy association journal called literacy um, but my student, um, Kate Kavalik, and I got really interested in, well, what's actually happening with Instagram and how are people using it in different ways? How many people here use Instagram? Okay, so... <laughs> my wife. <laughs> my wife does, yeah. Um, but it's interesting, right? So with Instagram, you can choose to have it public or private. Um, I feel like my friends are pretty much split in how they do this. Uh, my Instagram is public, just like my Twitter, but my Facebook is quite private, so I just tend to share a lot of my like, like family and like friend photos around Facebook. Um, but then Instagram, most of it is actually like, like travel photos or you know hiking or rock climbing, whatever it is. Um, we noticed like a, maybe two years ago how many people were using it as a way to share poetry, and if you think about it. Instagram is a really great tool because one, you have um, like other tools like Canva. If any of you have used Canva, it makes creating and editing these kind of images so incredibly easy. Um, but then with Instagram, it's often used like, as a springboard for poets to share their work with this worldwide you know, audience. And so if you look at a poet like Rupi Kaur, who last time I checked, she had several million followers. Um, she's actually become this like New York Times best-selling author. She's toured the world. I've actually seen her speak in Sydney, but began on Instagram. You know, I see last time it was like 3.6 million. Um, but she has millions of followers, and this is a way for her to share her poetry. And so for other poets, whether they use a hashtag that's just like a hashtag poetry or hashtag poetry community, or whether they're looking at specific issues, um, like one of the young people in the study that I'll talk about was actually looking at um, like self-harm. And this is a way for her to talk about her lived experiences and share it within a community that was going to be supportive. It's quite incredibly powerful. And so here's another example where they've, again, this kind of multimodal work that I was talking about before and this, really this multimodal counter-narratives, actually editing the, um, the poem to kind of look more like this, um, like it's found poetry, um, but then having the image in the background, the profile of the face. And so here she's used some different um, the hashtags. Um, she says, you know, I stand in solidarity with my brothers and sisters with mental illness. Let's end the stigma and talk about mental health. And through using the tags and the hashtags, 
reaching out and being able to talk about her own experiences, but also reaching um, a community of people who are going to be supportive. And often what we found with Insta Poetry, just like a lot of the um, spoken poetry that's happening in communities, teachers and parents have no idea what's going on, right? Because it's something that happens you know, outside of these kind of like governed spaces of, of school and home. It's really happening in these third spaces, whether they're online. Um, but it brings up a lot of interesting issues for researchers. And so the other part I want to talk about with research is the ethics of it. So in addition to the methodological innovation, I find the ethical challenges that we encounter as learning and literacy researchers just fascinating. Um, so at the University of Sydney, I'm one of the university's research integrity advisors, and I'm also chair of our humanities ethics committee. So it means that for the past seven years, um, uh, the bulk of the, the ethics applications that are happening within education research kind of come through my committee. And so it's a fascinating experience to then be sitting with a committee of about six to seven colleagues where we're trying to work out the ethics of the study. And because we're looking across humanities and social sciences, we're looking at everything from education to experimental philosophy, um, to economics, and to see what's typical in the different disciplines. Um, but it brings up a lot of like, ethical issues, particularly around online research. And um, I can pass this book around too, but this is a book that um, several colleagues and I published a couple of years ago, where we're thinking about how do you conduct this kind of learning and literacy research in online spaces, but also what are some of like, the ethical challenges associated with it. Um, so that's around space, and that's interesting. Um, so there we do talk about like, the data collection and the data analysis, um, the different like, theoretical and conceptual perspectives that, that might be useful as well. Um, but this study of Insta Poetry brought some of those to light. Um, so some ethics committees will say, if you're collecting data that already exists in the online space, you don't need ethics approval, right? Because it's there, it exists in the world, you don't need it. Um, what we found in writing this book is that it varies tremendously, university to university, country to country, ethics committee to ethics committee, how they actually perceive all of this. Um, and I think it's something for those of us who do research in these spaces to keep in mind, because often then we have to serve as advocates for the kind of methodological approaches that we're using because a lot of times people in ethics committees are only used to you know, research that's happening face to face and they don't know if or how that's going to translate into online research. So to give you like, a quick example from another study, some colleagues and I have done a lot of work with fan fiction. So in fan fiction is you know, where you're taking the settings, the characters or themes from exist, you know, works that exist in the world and making them your own, maybe publishing them online through you know, something like fanfiction.net. If I quote directly from that short story, you can put that into Google and you'll probably come across that exact story on fanfiction.net and you'll come across the username. If you come across that username, then usually if you Google that, you'll come across the exact young adult, her full name, location, and personal identification. So I've written entire articles on fanfiction and never once directly quoted from the fanfic. And then we've gotten some pushback at times from reviewers or editors saying, well, how can you write this article on this if you're not giving us any examples? And so this is part of what we've then had to argue is, well, if we actually want to protect the privacy and the confidentiality of our youth participants, we actually can't quote directly from it. So one of the ways we've worked around that, um, so we developed this other process where we're looking at how do you analyze the, um, the interaction and the feedback between like, the writers and the reviewers and we'll often give like illustrative examples that are like general enough that you wouldn't be able to come across that specific one, or we'll create ones that are um, kind of like a um, like a um, like a combination of a couple different ones. So it's still like authentic in like the sense that you you get from it, but it's not revealing who our research participants might be, especially if they are talking about um, you know really personal issues that they might not want disclosed with like their real name. And so in recruiting for the study in Insta Poetry, um, my student Kate, so you can see she actually used her full name there. And so she used a lot of different hashtags that were common um, within the community as a way to recruit. Um, we got a lot of pushback from the ethics committee on direct recruitment. So they said, well, you can't just you know, send a DM to some poets because you're potentially directly recruiting children. And actually they didn't want to allow us to um, have a steady focus on youth at all. I said, well, why don't, why don't you just look at 18 plus and then you'll be okay. 
Well, I said, well, look, that's actually the whole point of the study is to look at how, like, youth ages 13 to 17 are using this and are creating poetry and are disseminating it, you know, through Instagram. Um, and so we really had to push back against some of the restrictions they tried to place on us through, like, not using DMs, for only looking at adults. Um, and that way we were really, you know, positioned as having to be advocates for this kind of online research. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's something that we want to keep in mind with a lot of this different work that we're doing, is how are we making sure that our participants, their confidentiality um, and their privacy are respected? How are we making sure that the space that we're entering to is safe? Because um, even like with a, a poem, you know, like this, where it's with mental illness, sometimes things happen in our research on poetry that we just don't anticipate. So like that boy that came out that day, you know, like that wasn't like on the lesson plan, you know, like how do we make sure we check in with him afterwards and say like, hey, look, are you okay? You know, and you know, are you sure, you know, is there other support that you need that, you know, I can offer you or we can you know, connect you with the school because this is you know, something major that's going on. Um, or the student who, um, like originally this particular um, uh, research participant hadn't talked about like, mental illness and cutting, but then that's something that we had to talk about with my student and I is, well, how do we make sure you know, that, that she's okay? And this is something that she has a support for because she lives in Germany. We're never going to see her face to face. Um, but it's these are the things that often come up with research whether it's happening face to face or online, but we have to just then think about some of like, the, the ethical challenges around that too. And so, um, so the anonymity, especially the unidentifiable nature of online participants is another crucial element for accessibility. Um, online spaces often allow for this tailored self-presentation, to use some of Goffin's words, and self-disclosure. Um, something else that's come up, I've done a lot of work with um, Alicia Magnifica and Jane Lammers. Uh, we gave a presentation once and someone said, how do you know this is a 17-year-old girl? They're not just like saying that. That's a great question. And then um, Jane said, well, it doesn't matter, right? Like, if they're portraying themselves online, you know, as a 17-year-old girl, and that's the identity that they've adopted, you know, like, at what point do we, do we take people, you know, at, at face value? And so, um, then the other side of that is sometimes our participants really do want to be named. You know, like, Tommy, like, that's Tommy's real name. He's been quoted in publications, and he wanted his name to be associated with that. Um, Sarah Mansour, it's the same thing. You know, she's quite proud of her work as, as poet. So, so what we strive to do as researchers is to engage in informed consent and that's you know one of the you know the pillars of, of research and to let participants know okay you can be quoted you know by your full name you know by your screen name um by a pseudonym you can choose it or we can choose it and here's kind of the benefits and constraints either way you know so for tommy if you Google him now, 16 years on as an adult, you'll probably still find that poem, you know, that he, you know, wrote, and it's, it's on Vimeo. Um, then the other thing, too, is if you look at some of our, like, the handles uh, from, like, Instagram or from uh, fanfiction.net that our young people have used before, um, sometimes, like, those have changed, or they've, uh, or sometimes even, we did a whole study, like, on figment.com, that site doesn't exist anymore. You know, it's been bought, it's been changed. And so this really like, ephemeral nature of both like the data itself in online spaces, but even like the participants and the names and how they go by can present some different challenges. And so um, especially, you know, like we have this great article written on, on figment.com that doesn't exist. So the findings that we have from the study need to be able to apply beyond the site itself, beyond the tool itself, to think about like, the literacy practices really embedded in that. And so that's just something to think about just in terms of the methodology, in terms of like, the findings and how you're disclosing them. Often we need to think if we want our research to have impact beyond just like this tool or this space or this time or this place, how can they be um, transferred? How can they be applicable you know, to other contexts and other ways? Um, but that's something that's just kind of come up um, with some of like, the, the online research. And a lot of us are doing work with technology um, whether it's you know things that we're developing or things that we are looking at kind of like in the wild that comes up with like how the confidentiality and the privacy and the anonymity all of that is respected and negotiated as well um, and it's something i've seen like as as an ethics chair to how people are using online tools to recruit participants and how that is yielding or not the validity and reliability of their data so just a quick example that's entirely unrelated to poetry um, if you look at Amazon's Mechanical Turk, so Mechanical Turk, 
I think it's only open to Americans. They can log in, like take a quick survey, make 50 cents or a dollar or whatever. And what I'm seeing some researchers, particularly in economics and experimental economics do, is thinking about this, well, these are some easy way to get people to complete your surveys. <clears throat> we had this one application submitted to the Ethics Committee. Look, there's eight of us with PhDs sitting around the table, and we could not figure it out. Look, there's multiple parallel worlds involved, and Eminem was in there some way, but then like there was aliens in the, okay, this is an entirely different area of research, but we could make sense of it. And I said, look, if you actually want people to take this seriously, it's gotta be accessible, and otherwise people are just going to click through and you know, click some buttons, make their 50 cents their dollar, and, and go away. So just because online spaces exist for us to, you know, kind of get some you know, easy participants doesn't mean our data is going to be like valid or reliable from that. Then also, too, just because this data exists in the world, um, you know, like with Insta Poetry, presents other challenges for us as researchers, you know. So some of the benefits if you do online research is often, your study might come out on one date, but you can get this backlog of several years, um, you know, posts people have made, whether it's to forums or photos that they've shared online or stories that they've written. But at the same time, that could disappear overnight. When the site goes down, the poet deletes their account or anything else. So in terms of your own um, like research methodology and approach and organization, that has to be really on top because it can be quite ephemeral. And also the space can be gone, the person can be gone, and your data can be gone as well. And so you want to think about how you're collecting that and how you're managing that, particularly when you have these more involved studies with a number of different participants. So there's a lot of, I think, like benefits and affordances with conducting online research, particularly around like poetry and literacy, but also a lot of other things that we need to take um, into consideration. Um, the Insta Poetry we found was really interesting um, in particular because it allowed people to have this, this ready access to this you know, online world. Um, but it was also um, something where they had to think about which hashtags they're using and who they were um, communicating with and how they were um, choosing to use images or just um, say with the the words. And on the Instagram, you can have like multiple photos in there, like how the length of the poems and everything they're going to choose to use. So the next part I want to go into is looking at some spoken word poetry. Has anyone here ever seen spoken word on YouTube or gone to a poetry slam? So um, Sarah Munsworth, um, they showed the beginning of my Australia was an example of spoken word. Um, but this is something I started to get interested in because it was happening out of school spaces. And while a lot of my work is sort of rooted in classrooms, okay, what are teachers doing, you know, what are students doing, and, and how is this happening, um, I'm really fascinated with the kind of literacy practices that young people take up on their own, entirely like not governed by parents and teachers. Um, and a lot of this actually began with when I saw young people were reading The Hunger Games and getting really into all this uh, dystopian literature, and I saw them writing the fanfic on The Hunger Games. And similar with the Insta poetry and the spoken word, young people, you know, often we can disparage them and say, oh, they're, just, they're not reading and writing these days, and the literacy levels are going down. But when they find something, or they find a community, whether it's online or in their you know, local space, that's meaningful and they feel like they belong, like, that's really powerful, right? And it's another way to share their stories. And so, turning to spoken word now, um, uh, as I was saying earlier, the largest slam in Australia is in Bankstown, so rooted in Western Sydney, and it's a very diverse area of the city. And some of the, the emergent research on spoken word shows it's a really popular form of creative expression, particularly among marginalized youth. So, so to go back to the idea of talking back, a lot of the work that I've done around spoken word poetry, poets are saying, well look, I feel like often in Western Sydney, just like Sarah Mansour was saying in her poem, you know, it's you know, the media headlines and the, um, the stereotypes, and this is a way for young people to really talk back against that. Um, it's a form of poetry that combines the written language and conventions of poetry with performance, using their voice, movement, um, musical instruments, props to enhance meaning. And if you remember I was saying earlier about how the higher school certificate, this examination, has this um, list of um, like prescribed texts that teachers need to choose from. Just in the past year, they added two spoken word poems, one from Kate Tempest, who's a, a British poet, and one from Luca Lesson. But teachers are still really unsure like how to even make meaning from these, let alone like, how to teach them, let alone how to assess students' performance poetry. So one of my current students, we're actually doing a study of that to figure out how are teachers even seeing this and what are they going to do to take it up. 
So I want to begin and show you some um, this poet's uh, poem that some students created, talking about their own cultures. The clouds, splodges of white floating above a blue canvas. Beneath, Beneath us, the lush green grass of New Zealand, home to Kiwis, home to me. He reo Māori tākūreo. My language is Māori. He Māori a hau. I am Māori. Me kua ana au ki Māori. I am proud to be Māori. Swish from the peaceful sounds of the oceans to blaring traffic and people yelling over each other just to be heard. Hōn Gujarati Bōlucha. My language is Gujarati. Hōn Gujarati Chū. I am Gujarati. Hōn Hamesha Gujarati Hōi. And I will always be Gujarati. Chur, how do I keep your name? Come here. To a feast like you've never seen before. Believe me, us Maldives, we love to eat. The smell of the land steaming off our hangi when it's pulled from beneath, but without our kamuana, the seafood, our feet is a complete. I mean, Gujarati to kawanama pelo number. Gujaratis are always first place when it comes to eating. But our food sound kind of murderous. Foods like tokra, fafra, kakra, hango. Don't get us started on dessert. And don't get me started on dessert. <laughs> we, we come, come from, from lands where happiness shines brighter than sunlight through stained glass windows and where laughter and joy are endless. But throughout the years, you've constructed yourself an image. An image of anything but what we are. Poor. Terrorists. Alcoholics. Thieves. Druggies. Taxi drivers, violent, abusive. To you, it's either this way or that way, with no in between. We are simply not to be trusted. trusted. But I will not lie to you. Some Gujaratis are terrorists, and some Maldives are violent. But that doesn't count for everyone, and, and that, that doesn't, doesn't count for us. We have a voice. And we will scream so loud that our languages will thunder over every crowd. And this time we won't be silent. The strength that our culture gives us is as deafening as the lion's roar. But this is what it means to be us. I am Māori. I come from a place where your uncle will pick up the guitar and play nearly every song with just four chords. Where gumboots are like our second pair of feet where beauty is natural and multilateral, where obviously the All Blacks train to beat the Wallabies. <laughs> and where Chur has more than just one meaning. I am Gujarati, a place where every household has its own way of cooking, where everyone can speak the same language in many ways and still understand each other, where every household will dance goba on Christmas and they will still enjoy themselves in rich or poor but you don't see this you only see the stereotypes we are forced to carry but they will never weigh us down we are young women from australia away from their homelands but still we shall outshine violence and stand tall and proud like tin soldiers and ready to fight our all our giants <laughs> were two girls that were um, uh, they're involved with some spoken word of workshops in the school that drew from some of the um, green based spoken word but I want to show this one because it was an interesting example of um, the collaborative nature of poetry as well because that's something with creative writing um, where there's a lot of young people it's really intimidating to do on your own especially if you're told you've got to write something you're staring at like the blank page or the blank screen and don't even know where to begin um, but this kind of thing where they're working together and they're incorporating their home languages and it's something where they're actually doing that same direct address that Tommy did, like you and I, and really thinking about who their audience is and the message that they want to send. This is where I think like that kind of critical literacy really comes out. Um, so to kind of bring it together, I want to kind of like present four kind of key findings from all these different studies of poetry and thinking about what it means for young people, but also what it means for us as teacher educators and as researchers. And so the first, I think, is by welcoming students' lived experiences and celebrating their voices, teachers can create a third space. As either the third space, and some of you might be familiar with it from some of Chris Gutierrez's work, is a space that um, isn't quite home, it's not quite school, it's not quite community, 
but it's a space where diversity and hybridity and um, individuality can really be celebrated. And there's no single language or mode um, is privileged. And so poetry can create a third space for literacy development by utilizing a critical pedagogy that links students out of school literacy practices and lived experiences with their in school literacy and language development. And what I've seen with poetry from these different examples of the digital poetry, um, the remixed poetry, the spoken word, um, wherever it's happening, and it's, it's allowing students to think about their own voice and their own experience and to bring that to bear on their understanding of the world and to share with others. And going back to the idea of empathy and how do you get someone to understand like where you're from, you know, and, and what you've gone through. I think poetry can be a really powerful vehicle for that. I think that that's something that teachers can cultivate within the classroom as well. And so this is where students can really bring their own linguistic and sociocultural resources to the classroom and they can express in ways that might otherwise be restricted. You know? So especially you know, the, in Australia where I teach, you know, it's a really high stakes environment where you're told you have to you know, write an essay in this way and you have to write a short story in this way and you're going to be marked in this way. You have to do it exactly right because otherwise you're not going to get that mark that you need for university. If you don't get to university, you know, and then you know, where's your worth as a human being? Um, I think it's really important for students and teachers to create that space and to really carve out that time where writing can happen that's not highly assessed, you know, because if the only writing students do in schools is very high stakes and it's assessed in such a way that you might be moved into a different class, like in a week's time, I mean, that's going to be incredibly problematic and also really disincentivize you from writing in a lot of ways if it's only writing for the teacher and for that mark. And I think this idea of critical literacy, I mean, most of us have, you know, like taught about it um, in our own practice um, and really cultivated it in our classrooms, is that how do we actually develop these critical literacy skills? And we can see this in a number of different ways in secondary classrooms, um, where I've done everything from like different units on like critical media literacy to have students actually recognize like how ads work. And I still remember um, I had one year eight student we were looking at magazines and she said, oh, I didn't realize that that's an ad. I thought they were just telling you what to buy and just kind of took it at face value as a directive rather than something that she should be a bit more critical about. Um, and so I think this kind of critical literacy is really important in this day and age, and poetry is a really great um, way to cultivate that. And so I think that especially looking at the idea of power relations, and some of the work that um, has come out of the, um, the U.S. around the Rethinking Schools, and if you know that magazine or that organization, Rethinking Schools is fabulous. Um, they published a number of different books. I'm thinking of um, like Linda Christensen. She's a, a teacher in the Pacific Northwest. Her book, um, Reading, Writing, and Rising Out, thinking about what we can actually do to have students look at um, power relations and have them think critically about um, code switching, right? And how their own employment of language um, is going to be different whether they're talking with friends, talking with employers, talking with community members, talking with family. And a lot of us unconsciously do that code switching, right? But to, to talk about that explicitly and how that can be powerful um, is, is really useful. And looking at the intersections of race, class, and gender, and how that can influence a text creation and perception. I feel like we do a bit better job in schools looking at race and gender. We don't often talk about class. And class is one of the things that's often quite invisible until it smacks us in the face, right? And I see with my own pre-service teachers, I was just talking to Frederick, where my pre-service teachers, some of them are from very affluent areas of the city where they live on the harbor and they've got these gorgeous views and they went to independent schools. Some of them are from Western Sydney where they grew up in a very diverse neighborhood, their first and family to go to university. And so within the classrooms that I teach in, my students are incredibly diverse. And often class is something that's not spoken about because it can be pretty uncomfortable. It can be um, uh, just pretty embedded in our ways of being, but often then students pre-service teachers are confronted with it when they go into the schools and looking at that, that class diversity or some of the assumptions that they have about how people should be in the world and how they should operate. I mean, even if you go back to this, the HSC exams, some students just assume, well, of course you're going to have tutors for multiple subjects, and of course you're going to have this family support to not realize in the reality of a lot of their students, they're working 20 to 30 hours a week or they're caring for family members. Um, so the idea of class is something that is often invisible but some can come out through the work that we do here. Then to foster critical literacy, um, students must engage in dialogue and consider the power relations that value certain voices over others and reflecting on their own identity and positionality. 
And this is something that I'm seeing more in Sydney, particularly related to religion. And so, um, like in Sarah's um, poem, and we are talking earlier about you know, why women, some choose to wear the hijab and some don't. You know, and the Muslim women that I've worked with are very articulate in why they choose to express their religious beliefs in certain ways. And um, one of my good friends who is um, Indonesian born, but then uh, was a principal at a Muslim school in Madison, uh, Wisconsin, which again is um, it's not very diverse, said, so look, every day when people look at me, I am the face of Islam. You know, and she, one of the reasons why she chose you know, to wear the hijab. This next poem I'm going to play is a young woman talking about her religion and talking about her identity as a young Muslim woman. And I think that this kind of critical literacy really comes out in how she's able to articulate her identity, her positionality, but again, also doing that direct address that we see in a lot of the other poems. The truth is that Islam is not like any other faith. It is a religious equivalent of fascism. And just because the followers of this savage belief are not the killers in this instance does not make them blameless. Dearest you, 5.31 a.m. Fajr prayer. Come to prayer, come to prayer. Come to success, come to success. The call to prayer is the blanket which haunts my mind each and every morning. I wake with the birds as they set off for the day. The tinge of sweet, fresh, and deep dates sugarcoats the words which come from my mouth. As the moon loses himself to let the brightness of his beloved room, the sun rises to greet me and my parents as we finish our prayer. My mother's body warmth is entertaining off of her. Her presence elevates me. Papa's moody eyes focus on me as he passes his treasure of gold. He always knew how to comfort me with just a look. My mother's home cooking had sent me into a day so deep I fought the urge to get out of it. My dainty neck was hung low, dressing my body in gold to rest assured that my exterior matched my interior. Soft. It was just my typical Friday morning. How about yours, sir? Sir, are you there? There is no might and no power except by you. I uttered as I left my life in the hands of the one who created it. I felt the envy from the sun for the brightness of my smile I just my face in that day. That day, it was just my typical Friday. The moon envied the mystery he stole from it. The deep leather of his jacket was as ragged as my car tires. The moon pitied the powers he stole from it and the stars ate themselves at the sight of his piercing eyes. How are you, sir? Sir? Hello? Where'd you go? 1.06 p.m. during my prayer. An aching of my soul caused me to take a step out of my busy life to speak to it. Are you okay? The question I wish I never asked myself. My soul hid at the back of my body. She locked herself inside the room she created for herself when I always neglected her feelings. My precious soul, talk to me. What is burdening you today? I felt the way my parents did when I stared my bedroom door so hard my door handle came off, rolled down the stairs and fell into their lap. It was soul crushing. I fell into prostration. With the deepest of confusion, my heart squeezed out every bit of sincerity she had resided in her. Oh my Lord, my soul has abandoned me. Help me get her back. Enlighten her with your light. She came back. She led me to the article, the heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, soul diminishing article. I wish I never asked for her that. Gunmen who opened fire in Christ Church Mosque addressed the attack in Manifesto. New Zealand PM, dozens killed in terrorist attack on mosques. Updated, report, 30 killed, wounded in New Zealand mosques, blood everywhere. Christ Church shootings, people injured, 20 dead, 30 dead, 49 dead, 51 dead. What? Sir, we're getting concerned. Please answer us. No, 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 they've got it all wrong. You've got it all wrong, don't you see? My parents never told me it was like this. Why on earth they're not born me I'll have to live with this? Papa, don't hide. Where are you in all this? Why are we terrorists, Papa? Why, oh, why are we here? Mama, your vow is too bright. They will see you. Oh, my, I cannot let them see you. Maybe we should stay inside, or we can gather our belongings and move to Mars. Papa, hide your van. I know how they are. They'll assume, Papa, please, whatever you do, don't go to the mosque. What have you done to me, sir? Sir, this is serious. Please answer us. 
So when it's 8 p.m., we'll go pray. I started my prayer from hid beneath my veil, worried the walls would talk, and let them know that the terrorists had found rest within them. I fell down in prostration and found my soul open the door. Rather than running away, my soul sat with me. We questioned a series of events that led him here, led us here, led the whole world here. I'm washing my hair till my scalp bleeds. The steam of the water lifts the tiny hairs that make rest on my body. Fear is taking over and the spark in my eyes is diminishing. I feel like scrubbing the roll off my skin. Mama, mama help. Which route do I take back to the room? 8.34 p.m. is your prayer. The last time I would fall into prostration today, my brothers and sisters would not do the same. I'm hanging my heart on the clothing line to air her cries, but they mess, they make rest in the burden I'm holding. Despite the bloodshed and disaster, the everlasting tinge of days is still at the tip of my tongue, still sugarcoating everything that comes from my mouth. So, sir, I have some sweet words for you. Dearest you, hello, brother. Thank you for answering us. I am nonetheless not here to abuse you, nor will I curse your name. I hope when you leave your confinement, you go home, hug your family, and live. Live through the path you wish you took. Don't look back. Forgive yourself, forgive others. Dearest you, you may be a thief to our happiness, stolen our treasures of what lights up our hearts, with a sense of agony but relief you could never steal our fate. Dearest you, Fear the loss, we will find the end, we will use the game, and we will grow. Please do the same. Dearest you, brother, your message has been seen by the world, scarred my heart and left my soul weeping, but I have a message for you. The truth is, Islam is not like any other faith. It is a religious correspondent of peace. And because the center of this brutality was done by you, makes us blameless. The truth is, Islam is not like any other faith. It is an advent of happiness. The truth is, Islam is not like any other faith. It is a religious comparable of forgiveness, which is why we forgive you. Salam, peace be upon you, your sincerely humankind. So this was actually written not long after the, the Christchurch um, massacre, and as a young Muslim woman felt that she wanted to respond to that. Um, in Australia, we have something called the One Nation Party, which is basically a white supremacist party um, led by Pauline Hanson. And after some of the Christchurch massacres in New Zealand, um, there's a lot of um, Islamophobia, a lot of, a lot of um, anti-Islamic sentiment. Um, and there's even been um, political attacks on the Bank of which is um, from one of the One Nation um, uh, elected officials. So his name is Mark Latham, and he decided to attack the Bank Sam Poetry Slam as a radical um, Islamic organization who are promoting that in the schools because they've also received government funding over the years. So the Poetry Slam had to hire um, security guards, and because he's just recently uh, won like, re election, we're debating what do we actually do now to either get on the front foot or to counteract some of this. And so um, one of my projects in the, the coming months is to write an article for something we've called The Conversation, which is um, basically academics writing for like a popular audience. Usually about, do you have it here as well? It's, 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 um, it's about like, a thousand word articles, but it's academics writing for a popular audience. Um, but in doing so, I know it will like intentionally incite, you know, like the One Nation Party. But I think that they, you know, after he had attacked the banks on poetry slam, I went to them and said, well, do you want me to say something, right? Because coming at this as someone who does have the letters behind my name, someone who does have the university affiliation, someone who has done the research, on one hand, that might help, but on the other hand, is that my place? Do you know what I mean? Like, and so that's something that we've been talking about kind of within, um, within um, those of us involved in the poetry slam community, but also people who are you know, wanting to you know, protect the young people in our community, people who are wanting to make sure that the Muslim people in our community feel safe and they feel heard and they don't feel um, attacked as they so often are by, by these people. And so I, I chose to include this one because it's a really powerful example of a young 16-year-old girl who's responding to this you know, international terrorist incident, but also responding to someone um, who is Muslim and who wants to make sure that her faith isn't misrepresented, whether it's by her elected officials or kind of within the media like writ large. And so kind of going back to the idea that I had earlier, this kind of critical literacy, um, again, 
I don't want to think that the purpose of education is just to make sure our students can write essays under time conditions, right? Like, if that's why I went into this profession, like, I got it all wrong. But I would like to think that the purpose of education, particularly in like literacy education and English classrooms, is to have our students think critically about the world around them, think about their voice, think about how they can express that, and think about, like, why they need to, right? And, and not even just, like, showing up to the, the polls, but also why they need to really talk back against some of them. Um, the ways in which they, their community, their friends, their family, their loved ones are being portrayed. And I think this is a really powerful example of that. And so the next thing I want us to think about is uh, having us do like a little bit um, of writing. Um, so I want to think about how as teacher educators, because I know a lot of us work in that space, um, also as teachers, how we can use mentor texts and writing prompts to foster this kind of critical literacy development and thoughtful re reflection. So I'm going to have you do a little bit of writing um, yourselves now. Um, but what I want to think about is the um, the poem that Sarah shared earlier, My Australia, and also the I Too Hear America Singing. So look, I've been in Norway for less than 24 hours, so you're going to have to help me with this. I want you to think about what Norway means to you what traditions are part of the fabric of your life. I mean, last night at dinner I learned more about like some of like, the, the cheese and some of the beer and the fruit and things like that that I wouldn't have known. What memories you hold dear. Think of your senses, some of the imagery there, the sights, the sounds, the tastes, the textures that come to mind when you think of Norway. What makes this country home to you. And then, so it's kind of want us to have a bit of a conversation and just kind of think about well, what does Norway mean, you know, and, t and tell me, right? Like I've, I've been here for less than a day. Like, what does Norway mean to you? And then I'm going to have you do a little bit of writing, you know, about your Norway. So, talk to me. What does Norway mean? How would you describe it? What are your experiences, your memories, traditions? Try about national anthems earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, do you want us to talk or write? This will talk first and then we'll write. Talk first. We just have to go for it. <laughs> yeah. Norway to me is uh, is freedom of expression. Uh, the legal system, mm -hmm. which gives me the opportunity to do uh, basically what I want. Yeah, to have that freedom to, that to develop see. my whatever I want. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Other thoughts. More on that note, also living standards, clean water, mm. ingredients, and so on. Yeah, so it's the safety, the security, you know, like the sustainability, like all of that is just, you know, just mm -hmm. part and parcel of being here. So what else? I'm thinking like space, like in terms of nature, that mm. there's room in general, but also you know, in other ways, we have maybe more space to think and to <coughs> speak freely. Yeah. Kind of the physical space, but yeah. the plan was landing yesterday. I just saw like, the vastness of it and everything, mm -hmm. but also kind of that the mental space and that you know the the lack of like the censorship or condemnation in some ways. Yeah. You know, I feel other places. Yeah. So in that sense, to me, it's sort of it, it kind of what does Norway mean to you? It sort of means safety in a way because mm -hmm. it, you I know I most of the time because I have the space mm -hmm. both in terms physically and also yeah. to express myself. Mm. Other thoughts? To me, it's like peaceful and quiet. Yeah. And sometimes too quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, right? You know, depending on like, where you grew up and everything, sometimes like the peace and quiet, you know, for some, I have some friends that grew up in cities, so they, for them, like the, the background noise is just like the, the traffic and everything. And they come out to the, you know, come to nature and they're hearing birds, and it's very disconcerting, mm -hmm. right? So it's the peace and the quiet and the space. Yeah, I mean, I could say almost everything that has been mentioned yeah. could go on a list of reasons that I'm here and my husband and I chose to come back to Norway. Yeah. Um, because we, I mean, it was it was a conscious decision of what kind of life do we want to have and mm -hmm. where is the best place that we can have that. And being two Americans, yeah. where you grew up with the idea of the American dream, oh, yeah. uh, it's, it's really, really hard. it's it's uh, it's so interesting to think that you know we're not the only ones looking elsewhere for that now mm -hmm. and because of the value system of this country and because of 
the space and the importance of nature and because of all of these things, uh, it's, that's part of what draws us to it. Yeah. yeah. So, and what's fascinating too, so if you have this discussion with your priests or teachers, for instance, or a group of high school students, everyone's going to have kind of a different experience, right? Some of us um, chose to come here as immigrants. Some of us students came here as refugees, you know, the people who were born here. And if you think about the different like sensory imagery, so what I'd like you to do is take like five to seven minutes, and I want you to write a short poem, my Norway. Okay? So just like in the vein, um, so using a metric text, it's seven stories, my Australia, you know, thinking back to the you know, I too seen America. But I want you to think about what your Norway is, and in particular, it might be helpful to think about the senses, the sights, the sounds, the tastes, the smells. Um, think about um, your own experiences. So maybe take a couple minutes right now, and whether it's like on paper or on your phone or on your laptop, um, write a short poem about your Norway. Okay. I'll set the timer for five minutes. <laughs> I'll write one too. Maybe I've been here for a day, but I, I anticipate what my Norway would be like.
have about one minute left. Take a minute just to finish up the line that you're on. Okay, and then maybe I'll have you come over to this group. Okay. The three of you can share, and the part I'm going to share over there. Please yeah. talk to the can you just sit next to you about what you've heard about and what your doorway involves? Anyone want to share? Huh? Anyone want to share? Well, I mean, I can, I can do, listen to some nice poetry. <laughs> As I said, you said, you know, I haven't been, uh, the, I haven't done this since I was. Uh, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can That's how we're doing it. <laughs> yeah. What's your doorway? I can start with my Are two lines. Uh, Norway to me is an environment where your feet are shoes and a place where all the the arguments are taken into account. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, I, I uh, <laughs> just wrote a few sort of lines, like bullet points. I said, my Norway is um, space I need to move. My Norway is the raw the uh, nature, the raw to nature, my dreams, of lush green and forest spreading across the landscape. The tranquility of uh, nature, the, the sound of the waves, and the bird singing in mountains, the, cold, the blessing of family and friends, and friends the knowing I always got somewhere to come back to. The extreme cold the during winter is followed by the pitch, pitch black yeah. darkness. Mm -hmm. But as I was reading this, I also sort of with the midnight sun making a hard sleep at night. Sort of High speed kind of internet this is that mom, connects to you know, every household. This is how I feel. <laughs> the law-abiding citizens mm -hmm. that don't Many say hello when you pass them on the street, mm -hmm. never say thank you to anything, so they don't hurt you to it's know. Not as <laughs> the safety net of the social welfare is the system that no one is taking for granted and still complain about. It's kind of how my husband Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we missed that place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, because I was yeah. like, as I was starting my looking at this with you know critical yeah. literacy like thinking, like and thinking, well, this all might our pro friends be problematic, you know. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. only yeah. one, yeah. It's, and it's I'm like white all the as well. Yeah. That have mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and I was very 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 so married to a It's like the fun side Are you from a different part of the life, or it's the concept, the idea? Okay, yeah, yeah. We're close to yeah. Belong anyway. No. So I'm also like. I think I thought you might be more than just how you talk about the <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, that's not. I mean, that's not how people who mostly spend time in Oslo talk about Norway. No. Yeah. I mean, they talk about it being dark and long summer days, but if you know how hard it is to sleep in the summer, <laughs> yeah. you, you 
you've been up there. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, we had that uh, blackout curtains there. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, I'm just used to it, so yeah. I need it. But, yeah. Uh, I have some of my friends with the these blackout the curtains, mm -hmm. and then during the winter they would have to have these like sun lamps mm -hmm. in their offices. Mm -hmm. My husband bought one of those. Yeah. Yeah. But when I saw the blue one in the morning, we have two black Yeah. 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 I. We often think of the, the contrast and the extremes. Yeah. Really. Yeah. It's like really missing it when we left. Yeah. The winter is extremely cold in Montreal. But like the light just wasn't there. And it's interesting because it's so high, I don't feel it the same way. The contrast line is extreme. No, no, they are. So, yeah. so, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I don't know if this group, I this group yeah. talked yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. um, it was really interesting to hear the different perspectives <laughs> and the different takes on this prompt, mm -hmm. right? So you had just five mm -hmm. minutes, like you can do anything for five minutes. Right, but some of the different things that came up in some of the poems, some were about like agency, some were about tranquility, some were about um, the, the personal and the professional. Um, uh, would you be able to share your take with like the My Norway? Like, would you mind reading yours? Wow. Okay. <laughs> and also, I remember I'm saying to like, calling on students, yeah. so I've just called in here. Right yeah. Now. <laughs> I'm inspired by what I've been reading up on, uh, like transformative learning. You know the. Uh, uh, okay, um, my Norway isn't mine, my Norway belongs to you, for us to shape into a time and place of recognition where we listen and co-create our future. So to me Norway is a concept, the, a way of, of living, it's not a country with legal laws and things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to think of like a country in that way too, right? Because it's it's it's, a, it's more conceptual, something that's like jointly constructed and negotiated, mm -hmm. right, and navigated. Mm -hmm. And then something that you pointed out too when you were talking about like your Nor Norway and the the freedom that you had to mm -hmm. kind of explore your goals, like person professionally, and the tranquility. But then also kind of made made you realize that that's not everyone's experience. No, I mean I, I I started to look at my own poem as like really stereotypical because I'm white and I'm born here, mm -hmm. and I realized this is my safety, this is my safe haven, but it might not be for a lot of other Norwegians who you know, have come in later with different backgrounds. So it made me sort of use my critical literacy and think that this could be problematic mm -hmm. as a poem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how could you see yourself, say some of your teachers, some of your teacher educators, why might this kind of exercise be useful in a classroom? If you're you know, teaching future teachers, you're working with you know, young people, why might it be useful to have them reflect on what their Norway is like? The teachers or the students? Yeah, uh, whoever you're teaching. Okay. So some of you like teach like high school yeah. students, some of you teach you know, pre well, teachers. Well, for the for 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 the freshmen coming in to mm -hmm. teach a training, yeah. I think just playing with the, or or you know get this awakening that I did. Yeah could be mm -hmm. very useful because they come in, most of them having a very safe upbringing, sort of being a bit of pampered, you know, and, and just to learn from very early on that you should include other perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From the whatever you read, no matter what you read or what you do, keep other perspectives in mind. Mm -hmm. I think this would work perfectly for that. I was going to say the same thing because you, you noted, you know, you had the self-awareness to sort of say, this is my experience, but I recognize this isn't the experience of everybody mm. in Norway, mm. and of every Norwegian even, and the, you know, people coming into a classroom, whether they're students or they're new um, teachers in training, might not have that self-awareness yet, mm. and that ability to recognize that mm. that isn't a universal experience. Yeah. So, yeah. I also think it's very important to think about, okay, because when, when you uh, create something like this, you also open up for all sorts of ideas. So you have to be prepared for racism, you know, homophobia. So you also have to have uh, some kind of a toolbox where mm -hmm. you, you have the courage to stand in that situation. Mm -hmm. Because in a democracy, uh, you mm. argue and you can try mm. to, to convince people to think otherwise mm. but people are entitled to their opinions and mm. sometimes 
in the classroom you get opinions mm -hmm. that you don't really like at all. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do you how do you deal with that? That's another thing of teacher training that yeah. I think mm -hmm. is really important. Absolutely. But it's important to have the courage to mm -hmm. to let these thoughts surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not to, to sort yes, of because you get that, to get that kind of training, yeah. you need to let them come to the surface, right? And I agree with you, I think it's really important. And it's tricky sometimes, but it's Mm. Very important. No, that is. Yeah, and something that comes up because I, one area that I feel we're really lacking in the teacher education at my university is teaching around um, LGBTQ issues, because like, I, like I'm the one that gives the one lecture to all the students that they get, and hopefully it's integrated into their other content areas. But you know, do some of my students because of religious beliefs or their upbringing, um, it's something they're deeply uncomfortable with. And so what I say to them at one point is, well, look. If you don't believe that all your students have equal worth as human beings, please don't go into teaching. You know, and just to see it as something that's about like this inherent value that people mm -hmm. hold, and um, and to think about you know what are the repercussions if you go and and believing and acting as if some of your students are less than you know, and I can show them statistics and everything else, but but just to kind of approach it from that kind of social justice perspective, like please believe that all of your students are equal because they will pick up on it like, if, if you don't. Mm -hmm. um, but I really appreciate some of the, the poems and the points that everyone shared here because it's it's just about bringing that kind of critical awareness and that self-reflection that, you know, when our students enter university at 18, 19, 20 years old, sometimes they, they don't have because of where they've grown up or the conversations that they've um, had so far. Mm -hmm. um, so let's take a little bit of a break, then we're going to come back and do like, a little bit more writing, then think about how this can apply to research as well. So I'm having a break. Have a chat. Mm -hmm.